is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magicians, Season 5, Episode 1. Do something crazy. In this episode, Alice is predictably not doing super well. Julia is doing a little bit better. Margo and Elliot? Probably the worst, I think. I'm very, very excited for this season. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. First of all, thank you very much to Jesse for not only commissioning this episode, but bearing with me when my schedule got screwed up today. So I'm starting this an hour later than I'm supposed to be. But here I am and I am ready to go. Um, I really liked this first episode. It really goes to show, I think, how little they really need Quentin for the show to work, you know? Um I am impressed and I've been impressed with the acting of a lot of characters, but it has been, I feel like they have really grown since the first season and you can see that a lot in the snapshots of what's going on with each of them in, in the opening of this new season. There's an interesting scene. The The whole episode begins with, Julia looking in the mirror, trying to decide what she's going to wear. And she is uh, going through her outfits while we get memories of Quentin that are clearly playing in her head as she is deciding. And it's a really like, I, I really liked this because it feels sort of unrelated like you could have had it be she, you know she's going through Quentin's stuff and she's remembering him she's doing something that's like magic and she's remembering him but be- because to us as outside viewers that's what makes sense right we see that somebody is doing a thing related to a certain character and thinking about that character and we're like yeah that's how that works but the thing is that's not always how it works our memories can come up because the thing we're doing made us think of another thing, which made us think of another thing. And that reminded us of the person. The connection does not have to be clear at all. So I kind of like that there's almost a bit of a misdirect here where because she's thinking about Quentin, for a minute you think that maybe there's something different happening. But then it begins to become a little bit clearer that this is just her trying to get dressed and look cute. And as she gets more and more invested in dressing up, she begins to perk up a little bit more. And the thoughts of Quentin begin to sort of fall to the wayside. Um, So Penny comes to pick her up and she turns around and she is wearing this wild sort of dress. I don't dislike it, but it is a weird, it it honestly was like more of a Margot dress. I feel like because it's extremely asymmetrical. And uh, the only thing that's like Julia about it to me is the color because it's a like silver gray. And that is her color. I, when I think of Julia, I think gray, which sounds insulting. Like when you say gray, I think a lot of people think of gray as like a blah, boring color. But honestly, gray is one of my favorites personally. Like I'm a big fan. It's a kind of a neutral, but it can feel very soft and sort of like sophisticated, but also, but in a way that's sort of natural um, rather than stark white. I really like gray. So I don't want anybody to think when I think Julia, I think gray. It's not, there's no color that I think of as being like, an insulting color to associate with a person other than maybe like, you know, 
a, that really gross green yellow. That's the only one that I'm like, oh, yeah. But other than that, I think all colors sort of have their place. Um, so Penny shows up to pick her up. And it's very clear that she has overdressed for whatever it is they're going to be doing because he hasn't told her what it is. And I, this is one of those moments that like, I get what they're doing here in terms of him going to take her on a date. That's a surprise. And she doesn't realize that she's overdressed until it's too late. Like, and that's all legit, but this is sort of a thing. Um, if you talk to people, if you talk to women who are single, they will put so much thought. It's, and I, I should say women who date men specifically, they will put so much thought into what they're going to wear and really like go all out planning a whole outfit, doing all of the grooming, yada, yada, yada. And they have just gone to a lot of trouble and they will show up looking unbelievable. And the man rolls in wearing whatever he pulled on before he went to work that morning. And it's nothing. And that is just such a thing. And so I kind of had a bit of a moment here with Penny where I was like, dude, come on, even though I know that's not what this is about. But there is just <laughs> there was a group I joined that was some it was like some uh, tag group on Facebook that was like um, men like men doing way less than women. And the banner image was Ed Sheeran and Beyonce who were sharing the stage at the end. I think it was at the uh, Video Music Awards one year. Maybe it was like the Emmys or something. But he is wearing literally an old T-shirt and jeans and like beat up sneakers. And his hair isn't even like combed off his face. And Beyonce is standing next to him in a full electric pink tool gown that trails behind her like 12 feet with these like un like these epaulets that stick out from her shoulders and her hair it's like and the two of them are like performing together and the the effort she put in versus what he put in it's just a you know and granted to a degree that's just a choice you know his brand is a guy who doesn't put in a lot of effort but also a woman can't get away with that the way that a guy can so anyway what it turns out they're doing is they're going to this like uh, wooded area and looking up at this meteor shower that a dude who is apparently like specializes in this sort of thing is essentially performing for everybody using his magic. And it's really, really cool to see. And Penny says, see, there's lots of ways to use magic to make the world a better place. And she steps away from him and says, wait, what? Is that why you brought me here? And I was kind of pleased to see that my reaction to something that he said during the finale turns out to be legitimate. Because when he says to her, yeah, I saw it. So what are you going to do with it when he sees that she got magic back? My immediate response is sort of like, dude, give her a second. Holy shit. What do you mean? What are you going to do with it? She thought she couldn't do this anymore and she just got it back. Let her like have a moment. Her friend just died. Like, what are you? Why are you acting like this? And it turns out that he is still sort of being that way. And I'm really like weirded out at the at the aggression that he's sort of like displaying about this he says you've been working so hard to try to figure this out and she said i told you it's my business and he says and i'm just trying to help you know to brainstorm and i'm like yeah but she has made it pretty clear i think that she doesn't want your help it sounds like you've talked about this before why don't you just leave her alone like this is so not up to you and it's not like the the only way that I can excuse something like this is if you are a couple that has really been together a while who lives together and the and if your partner seems to be struggling so much with dealing with something that you see it every day and it's beginning to like 
bother you because you're having to watch them struggle in a way that's very painful. And even then, sometimes you just have to like, let people fuck up and, you know, but that is one of those times where I can say, okay, it's not about you, but it is affecting you. But that's not what's going on here. Like they don't live together. Why does he feel so, like this need to push her to do something rather than just giving her some space? I don't know. Um, so they're in the middle of sort of talking about this. And she says, do you feel that? And he says, is that another surge? And we look up at the sky and see the meteors that are still flying around, but some of them are like really expanding and turning into a bit of like a mini supernova. One of them like crashes down and hits a tree. And uh, eventually one of them flares way, way bright. And then we cut to the little opening credits. The opening credits are interesting because like it's still... Let's see. Oh, sorry. Hugabug says, I think he wants to help so much because he feels a little guilty still about her losing it in the first place since he chose her humanity over her chance at godhood. That's an interesting theory. Hmm. I guess I could see that. And th and that makes it even more frustrating. Like, you know, your guilt is your thing that you need to deal with, dude. Do not make her responsible for making you feel better. That's not her job. If you feel guilty about choosing something that wasn't the right choice, that's something you have to cope with and figure out. But don't make that another thing for her to deal with. It's not hers. Um, but I see what you mean, Hugabug, and that might be exactly it. Um, but yeah, these opening credits, like it's the same, you know, side of a building that we have seen before the brick building that's sort of like in shadow. But instead of it being a tree outline, which we've had before, or just the vines growing or whatever, there, it's like a series of, of what look like octopus tentacles, or perhaps squid tentacles, like tangling up around a moon. And there's a whale in one corner and a bunch of like starfish and things like it. it's a very sort of undersea thing theme and there's also stars mixed in with it so it's a weird you know i'm not really sure what that's getting at but i'm interested to find out um so then we cut to her and penny still arguing and she says how is making like shooting stars helping when things like that can happen? And really, she says the, the surges, that is the type of thing I should be using my magic to fix. And he says, I just wanted you to have a break. So this is what was sort of weird to me is like, he's encouraging her to like do stuff with magic to make the world better. But it seems like she agrees. She's not arguing. She's just trying to do stuff on a larger scale. And what she winds up saying to him, I only have magic because I lost Q. I just have to find something to do with it that makes that worth it. To which he rightfully says, there is nothing you will ever be able to do that's worth losing him. And I thought that was an interesting moment that makes a lot of sense is that the responsibility she feels because of what had happened for her to get magic back. She just, there's a feeling to her, I think of not really deserving it, you know, and, and that his sacrifice is what gave this to her. And so she has to prove that she has somehow earned it. Now, the thing here for me, and, and granted, there's a whole other thing that comes up later and she needs to pursue that as her quest, obviously, but I will say that I feel I feel like the show started something that they were not prepared to finish regarding my perspective when they had the episode with Sheila and Alice fixing the pipes for that neighborhood. I am obsessed now with the idea of using magic to solve 
relatively small problems like that, that are actually huge, enormous systemic problems. Like I want, when she's saying there's, you know, there are so many things I could help with. And she's talking about the surges. I'm like, look, I understand why that's where your mind goes because that's something related to magic, but there is a lot of good you could do completely outside of what's going on in the magical community that would do a lot of good. There's just, there are so many things that she could do, you know, and, and I desperately like there's, there are, I, I can't even like, I, I have so many ideas in my head right now regarding like creating housing or finding places for people to like go to get out of the elements or stocking food pantries or creating some like, they're just, magic has in this show, there are so many spells that we as viewers do not know about. They pull out new magic on the show all the time. It's not the sort of thing where like within a, a, a certain number of confines, things can work or not work. And we are aware of that. The rules are changing all the time. To a degree, that can be a problem because it can feel like the show just pulls out whatever it feels like pulling out. And that I, I do like there being limits. I do like having very clear boundaries that sort of uh, make things feel grounded. But this show doesn't feel like the magic is the point. So it's not so frustrating to me, you know. Um, versus something like Doctor Who, where that can be a real problem for me, deciding to like set some rules down and then immediately break them. It makes me feel like, well, why are we doing this? Then you can obviously just choose to do whatever you want and n nothing has any stakes. So in, in my initial reaction to this was just, yeah, there's a lot you could do, Julia. And I wish that you guys would like step outside of the things that are so familiar and just look at some real world, real life issues that are going on. You know, the, the thing with the water and the pipes, there's also in the um, young wizard series that I'm covering, they create a spell that like filters water that's going into the ocean from the um, drainage system in New York so that the, uh, the, you know, the sound doesn't get so polluted and, there are all sorts of things that they could do to like improve, you know, we have the, the bees dying, do something about that. That's a major issue, just all sorts of stuff. Um, but she winds up having this confrontation with this pig dude later and it is amazing. So I'm not mad. So she it has her head on Penny's shoulder talking about how she keeps forgetting that Q is gone and thinking that she should ask him because he would know what to do and then remembering. And they get interrupted by the sound of glass breaking. And it turns out that the Dean is here and he is, broke a glass of scotch because he was sniffing it. And apparently neither of them pick up on the fact that this dude has clearly stopped drinking. It's not until he says so to Penny, like directly later that Penny's like, wait, what you stopped drinking. And I'm like, did you not hear him say he was sniffing the booze, dude? Alcoholics don't do that. They well, alcoholics do that. But somebody who's drinking is going to drink that shit. They're not going to sniff it. Somebody who is trying to get sober, but misses it. That's what they're doing. I mean, this is classic, like, <laughs> Yeah, no, that that made total sense to me. And it was funny to me how Penny did not pick up on that. Um, but it turns out that he is here to ask Penny, and really it turns out trick Penny, to become the uh, traveler teacher. And the reason is that there has been such an explosion of magic that tons more people are qualifying for break bills than they used to. So, and, and the reason that the magic is like so uh, 
prevalent right now is because of Everett drinking a, an entire reservoir worth of power and then exploding because of the thing with the mirror, you know, the, the whole, everything that happened in the finale. So normally traveling is an extremely rare skill, but now that there are so many more people qualifying, they have a lot more travelers than they would normally have. So Penny is being roped into teaching. And of course, <laughs> the dean doesn't tell him that's what it is until they're literally outside the door of the classroom. And Penny does not want to do this. Part of it is just sheer inexperience, understandably. But a bigger part of it is he knows how dangerous this is and he doesn't feel ready at all to take on the responsibility of teaching these kids regarding something that could kill them, very easily kill them. So the dean tells him that he could, that he could sign this waiver that will keep him from being responsible for the, uh, for any deaths that may occur. This indemnifies you against any claims, legal or magical, that your students might make. I can assure you that without your instruction, one of them will absolutely get killed. So Penny takes the contract and signs it without reading it. And it turns out that he has signed a contract agreeing to become a professor, but he doesn't find out about it until later when he tries to quit. And the Dean is like, Hey buddy, I don't know what to tell you, but you could fight me in court and you would definitely lose because that contract is binding and it's not my fault. You didn't read it kind of on you, buddy. And I was like, damn, that was cold blooded. And it's an interesting assortment of kids that he's teaching. And I'm super curious to find out whether or not any of these kids winds up like, does this crew wind, wind up being a crew that we get to know individually as, you know, distinct characters that become involved in the story? Or are they going to be kind of background to what's going on with all of the characters that we know much, much better? I'm interested in this new crew. I would be down to be introduced to them, you know, over time. Um, and it is sort of weird, like, because they're young, but they're not that much younger than Penny. So there's like kind of a weird vibe. You know, Penny like started this, uh, started at Break Bills. What has it been? Like three years ago so he hasn't it's not that far past where they are um but it turns out like none of the kids in this class have ever traveled before and that in particular is a big difference between penny's situation and theirs like he had very little control initially over his traveling and he wound up like in a few very dangerous situations due to it and these kids think that he's just trying to scare them when he tries to explain what could potentially happen to them. The response is sort of like, yeah, yeah, are you going to teach us or are you going to keep telling us about the fucking boogeyman? And he realizes like none of them actually knows what he's talking about because they haven't gone through this shit before. The only thing that all of them do have is that they can hear thoughts. That's about it. So his recommendation to all of them initially is put up wards and uh, get an anti-traveling tattoo and move on with your life. And he leaves. But when he is forced to come back and talk to them about it, he decides to try and look on the bright side of things a little bit more in a way that we don't really see from Penny very often. Understandably, I mean... But he takes them to see this. It's like, um, obviously, a whole other universe, some like, you know, or other planet, wherever it is he went, it's not on Earth. But there is a n another planet in the sky that 
is very reminiscent of like um, Saturn and it's a really cool view. And so he decides that he's going to, you know, let them enjoy this and sort of absorb what being a traveler can mean should they decide to harness what they can do a little bit more and appreciate it. And it's a nice moment because these kids are obviously not feeling super impressed. And when he shows them that it clearly like all of them are just like, Oh God damn. Um, now what happens next is a really, really weird one. He goes to sit on some rocks and this girl comes up to him and tells him that she's been hearing something that isn't a voice but it seems sort of like a signal. And he says, okay, well, let me take my wards down and that way I'll be able to hear your mind and you can show me what it is. So he sits down across from her and he does this thing touching his forehead. That's a very like literal feeling of like pulling his wards down. And you hear this odd sort of like, it almost sounds like a bad internet connection, you know, and he sort of like twitches and it seems to hurt him. And he attempts to lift his wards back up. It's like this metallic sound. And when he tries to lift them, it doesn't work. He can't lift it back up again. And all of a sudden, he vanishes. And when she opens her eyes, he's gone. And he reappears a moment later. Because I was sort of like, where the fuck did he go? Is he coming back? And he does come back, but he is really disoriented and freaked out. And he says, I couldn't control myself. And she asks, did the signal make you do that? And he is looking at her like he really doesn't know the answer. And that is sort of the last that we really see of Penny this episode. And I am really interested I am super, super curious what's going on there. Like Penny is being asked in to do this as the Dean puts it, because he's literally the only living traveler remaining on the planet. There's other living travelers that are other places. So he's like the only option. And he is coming up against something he has never seen or heard of before. And we have really, we saw, we were by Penny's side while he learned how to manage his traveling. And we saw how hard that was for him and how angry it made him. And watching him be like thrown back into that is is awful, you know, because I feel like we've really all kind of gotten to a place where we're like relieved that he is able to deal with it now and all of us having to witness him be helpless again to a degree that is unpleasant I don't like seeing it and I really hated him trying to raise his words back up and that not work I'm not certain if after the like blink out and back in if he is able to raise them again now it seems like the signal that he heard from her mind he's not hearing again in that scene but I'm not sure, you know, it's just a, it's a very unnerving moment. Um, so I talked a little bit about Julia. I'm going to jump back to her in a minute. First, let's go over to Margot and Elliot. So they are having martinis that they, I don't know where they got them from. They're in glasses and he has a cigarette and there's a real vibe to this of like, uh, like they just walked away from the hotel bar somehow. And I'm just like, where, where did y'all get this? Um, but the two of them are clearly sort of at loose ends. They don't really know what to do. And they are feeling a little bit like, you know, they talk about maybe going back to earth but because of the way that time is all fucked up, they aren't certain that they are going to be able to go back without it being even worse. Like, what if they jump back to Earth and it's jumped 300 years there as well? And now literally nobody that they know is even alive anymore. 
Um, it's a it's a a tough call. I don't think that that would be the situation, but there's no telling really. So they're in the middle of figuring out what they're going to do when all of a sudden they hear, oh, first of all, I love their conversation about like the dark king. That's really funny. Like, oh, doesn't that seem a little generic to you? We get it. You're a dark king. Congratulations. Um, oh, God. And I should mention, too. Excuse me. I know that I talk about the lip color on this show all the time. But I really need somebody to figure out what Margot is wearing in this scene because I want that lip for my wedding day. That is it. That is it, kids. That one right there that she has got on. This is perfection. And I love it so, so much. Oh, I love it so, so much. And she has a a sort of like matching magenta faux fur coat that is outstanding and spoilers that's what color my wedding dress is going to be is like that like bright berry color so that lip would go perfectly and i need it so that's your mission should you choose to accept it is track down the uh the makeup artist for the magicians Show them this picture of Margot in this episode and find out exactly what it is she is wearing in this precise scene because I want it. Um, so they get interrupted by a crowd that's passing by, all of them obviously in party mode. And this girl comes up to them with this voice. It is a uh, quite a voice. It's amazing. And it turns out that all of these people are cosplaying as the kings and queens of Fillory, including Elliot and Margot. And I love the two of the, they are mistaken for cosplayers of themselves, which is amazing. And it turns out that they're going to, What is it called? The unfettering, the unshackling, Um, which is like a play of the very, very loose history of Fillory and what happened to its rulers. So (laughs) this is really reminiscent for me of an episode of Avatar, The Last Airbender that Owen and I really loved and uh, mild spoilers, it pops up in the final season. And it's a play being performed about the characters in the show who have become famous across this country for what they have accomplished or not. And they go to see this play about themselves thinking that it'll be fun. And instead, they get really like upset and resentful at the way they are being portrayed. And That is kind of exactly what happens here, but it also hits a whole new level when it turns out that Fen was hanged and Josh was beheaded and Elliot is weirdly unaffected by this. It's a... I I really, really, really appreciated the confrontation that happens later between Margot and Elliot, where she's just like, dude, what the fuck? You should really be a lot more upset by this than you are. And they have it out a little bit there. And I'll get to that actual conversation. But I was noticing here that he just doesn't seem moved by the fact that Fen was hanged. And like, granted, they weren't in like a sincere relationship, but she meant something to him. Fen was not nobody, you know, he got concerned about her safety and welfare. And he was always like, trying to make sure that she was doing okay. And the fact that he has like no reaction to the news that she got hanged. Granted, yeah, at this point, it has happened 300 years ago. Nevertheless, though, to you, this just happened. That distance isn't the reality that you are living 
So that's just a rationalization for the fact that you are choosing not to feel anything about this. And it is a choice. We find out later that like he has basically self-medicated to not feel anything on purpose, um, which is par for the course for Elliot. But we shall get back to that. So, yeah, we have the like, I'm Margo and I'm always angry. I'm Elliot and I'm always drunk. I'm Alice and I died uh, or like, kind of. I'm Quentin and I'm dissatisfied all the time. Honestly, that was not like the word that I was thinking of. I, I didn't have like a single word. But when they came up with that one, I was like, oh, you know what? That's pretty good. Um, And when, you know, Josh and Fenn are executed, Margot gets up and runs away and is really agitated at the fact that they are in this position where they just have to, you know, accept that this is the history. And she insists that there has to be a way to go back 300 years to fix this. And what she tells him is that there is a, uh, she says, we're going to end game this shit, which I really loved that reference. <laughs> and we're going to we're going to time fix this bitch in the center of Fillory is a clockwork heart built by dwarves. They're the ones who taught Jean Chatwin how to do time magic. Uh, and she is irritated because as she talks about all this, Elliot has no idea what she's fucking saying. And it's just sort of nodding along, but like clearly not quite following. And she finally is like, dude, have you after everything you still haven't read the books are you kidding me and i was like that is the right reaction once you find out that fillory is real go read them granted they are not accurate entirely but they're certainly better than nothing maybe some things wouldn't catch you so totally by surprise sir if you had bought to do any homework at all so she says that we're going to dial back the clock and that she had ordered her people to begin tunneling to the center of the world when she was high king because she wanted to meet the clock dwarf and she is able to find the entrance to this basically slide in the to the center of the world and they go down there and this dude down here is first of all apparently subsisting on just these like cave mushrooms he is really funny, guys. I don't know who this actor is. Um, let me see if I can find him because like Amazon X-Ray is usually somewhat helpful. But let's see. Jack Kaler. Uh, he was in Bones, Monk, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Point Break, The Spy Who Shagged Me, Pineapple Express, Men in Black 2. Yeah. None of that's ringing a bell for me. I've seen some of those, but not enough to remember this guy from them. But yeah, he does a really great job of just being kind of like an offbeat, weirdo, sad guy. Um, and he explains to them that rewinding time is not how this works. This is not set up to go in reverse. It could literally destroy Fillory trying to do that. And obviously... This is not fucking what Margot wants to hear. They go back to the surface. And this is when she has the kind of like face off with Elliot. And I wonder if this is going to sink in at all. Because, I mean, I had said that I wondered if this was going to be the way that Elliot handled Q's death we know he is very bad at processing emotions he doesn't like dealing with them he doesn't really understand them and he doesn't like being vulnerable but I appreciated that Margot basically is like I know that's how you are and that's fine but I really thought with me your best friend it would not be this way 
he tells her that, you know, you know, we can get out of here maybe and go and drink some mimosas because he thinks that there is no fixing this and says, I hate to see you feeling like this. Can't we just get out of here? And she pulls away from him because he tries to touch her. And she says, I'm not just going to start feeling better. And what the hell is wrong with you? You should feel just as upset. And he says, I don't know. I guess it takes a lot to upset me, sir. Elliot, honey, has that literally ever been true? You can't believe that. He doesn't believe that, right? And she says, I think it's a case of being heavily self-medicated and in some textbook denial. And he claims this is managing it. I guess that's one word for it. I'm fine. She says, a monster rode you around for months while he murdered people. Then one of your closest friends died. And he says, I don't even remember anything from in there. And she says, as if that fucking changes anything, which correct. I mean, it really doesn't. And he responds with Quentin died and it hurts. And I don't really want to talk about it. Everything I have to say, you already know. So why? And he doesn't even really want to look at her as he says that, you know, there's a real feeling in that scene that he's probably like looking just to the left of her eyes, like not actually making eye contact. And he actually does turn his head away a couple of times. Um, and she says, if it were me, I would be driving a fucking semi down Fury Road. His response is, Yes, well, well, feelings are gauche, and I'm sparing you mine, and I thought you would be grateful. And she says, I don't care what you're like out there, but with me, I thought you'd at least try to be real. And he starts to call her Bambi, and she pulls away and says, don't Bambi me. If you're going to be this stupid, I need some time alone to calm down. And she walks away. And honestly, that moment of feelings are gauche, I'm sparing you mine. I thought you'd be grateful. If that shit isn't almost exactly what I have thought a couple of times in my life. I mean, practically verbatim, I don't like feelings either. Now, I am not somebody who goes to self-medicating because I have always been a bit afraid of, of getting into a bad habit because it runs in my family. Granted, I have started using CBD, but you know, it's not like that. It doesn't work that it doesn't dull things that much, you know, and booze is just something that I feel terrible after I like drink too much. I'll have a cocktail and that's it. I really like even two. That's usually bad news. But what I do do is isolate myself because I don't want to inflict what I'm feeling on other people. And that's what it feels like to me to share what's happening. Unless it's on the show where I feel like it's impersonal enough that people can listen and not feel the need to interact with me on it. I think that's part of why I tend to like cry more on the spoil me episodes. I don't have a co-host for this. So I feel freer to be emotional on this show because there's no co-host that has to cope with it because I don't like creating labor for people. And it's fucked up because when people care about you, that they want to be there for you. That's part of their job and they know that. And if you have good friends, they want to do that for you. But it is very hard to be willing to accept that help when you are like me or Elliot, evidently. And it, it, you know, you have to kind of get to a point where you literally cannot keep it inside anymore without absolutely cracking before you are willing to let any of it out. And 
I am not looking forward to Elliot reaching that point because I think it's inevitable he will get there. But I don't want to see what it takes and I don't want to see what he does in response. And this scene ends with him walking away from Margot, like taking a swig out of a fucking flask. And, you know, it's just a, it's a, uh, not a good sign. So she walks away from him to sort of, you know, cool down and consider things. And she's looking at the, um, scars on her wrists that say, you know, that she is not welcome in Fillory anymore. That's what these scars are meant to indicate. And one of the guards sees her and calls her banished scum and then knocks her out. And she winds up waking up in a cell where there's like a remnant of Josh panicking and mourning all alone. It's very upsetting. You guys, she's sitting there and he's like holding himself and chanting like it's going to be okay. And then says, who am I kidding? They're going to chop my goddamn head off. And she's trying to talk to him and realizes that he can't hear her. And then she figures out that like, he's not really there. And he says her name and that wherever she is, he hopes she's okay. He wishes she were here and that he wasn't going to die alone. And she goes over and like curls up behind him and spoons him basically. And there's a flash of lightning and he's gone. And it's really like cruel guys. That was a mean thing to do. I did not like it at all. I really, really didn't like no Surrey Bob. And she basically like the last we see of her is her laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, looking extremely forlorn. And we have no idea how long it's going to take before Elliot realizes that she's missing. So I better hurry it up because I've only got like 12 minutes left. I've still got to talk about Katie and Alice Um, so Alice is staying with her mom in a house that has been restored by magic evidently and looks bigger and grander than ever it has. And she is not doing super well. It turns out like she's getting a ton of mail from the library asking for her help. She has told them no once already, but they are not letting up. And she's laying in this room in the dark and her mother comes and like opens the blinds and asks her for help with figuring out like something to submit to the flower show, which she's definitely going to be cheating. Um, and they are interrupted by the arrival of Julia and Julia is a li- like when she sees Alice with her hair, which has not been brushed for days and food stains on her shirt. And obviously she's wearing the same thing that she's been wearing for like five days. Julia's sort of like, Oh God damn. Like she knows exactly what the fuck Alice is going through. But Julia is in a position where she has Penny to lean on. Alice doesn't really have anybody to lean on, but her mom, who is obviously like not, really getting it you know her mom is doing her best but she's still who she is um so it turns out julia came here to suggest that they try a seance so that she could talk to quentin and try and ask him his advice on what she should do and Alice just tells her that that magic is extremely dangerous and just not something that she should probably mess with. Um, and Alice says, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I don't know how to move on without him, but we have to do it. Right. And 
Julia just sort of like leans forward and puts her hand on Alice's knee and then gives her a book of cues that had a bunch of notes in it that he wrote that she thinks will sort of like bring Alice some comfort and make it feel like she is able to talk to him a little bit again. It's one of the plover books called the world in the walls. Um, and Alice seems really touched by this. Like genuinely, she's like kind of hugging the book by the end of the conversation. And honestly, it's a pretty sweet moment. And I like seeing the two of them relating to one another about their grief here. It just feels like a nice bond. It's a sad, traumatic bond, but I appreciate it being acknowledged. So then we have a moment where Alice is deciding like what she is going to do because she has a conversation with her mother and her mother says, I know what you're going through when your father died. I did some pretty crazy shit to get to the other side and make it through that. And if you need to do something crazy, do something crazy. Go ahead. And sort of gives her permission, which I really rather liked, you know, because sometimes that's just, you got to be not smart occasionally. Um, but I think that comes later. First, we have her uh, agreeing to the request from one of the librarians. And it turns out what she needs is a phosphoromancer for just an afternoon because there is a book that one of them has like warded using magic somehow. And they need her to basically make it readable. It's an interesting, like, you know, the, when, when she, I'm not even exactly sure how this works. Um, and by the way, the library is not like in good shape here. It's beginning to literally fall apart. Alice is walking down between the aisles and there are like books piled up outside of the stacks and there aren't staff that we can see. Um, and I don't remember the name of this librarian. Do you guys, the, the one that, you know, was in Firefly? Um, but she says, everyone's abandoned us. We've lost most of our branches. We can't even reach our people in the underworld. And they go into like the main office and Al Alice asks where Zelda is. And the librarian says, oh, who the fuck knows? She is a disaster. After you refused to help her for the 15th time, I kind of think it broke her brain. And she said, I can't be trusted to lead and like ran away. Apparently, there is nobody in charge anymore. So this lady is trying to continue on doing her job, but she's not trying to take the helm. She is not interested in that responsibility. I am really curious about the reason for the library completely like falling apart this way because like because she says everybody abandoned us and I am assuming it's because they found out that uh what's his name was like a baddie but I find that kind of surprising I mean I guess all of these people had a contract that maybe they signed under duress or maybe they were you know had worked with the library for hundreds of years and are finally excited for like freedom so that makes sense there is a feeling to a lot of them like they enjoyed their work but maybe they just have to make the best of it, you know, and they get the chance to leave and they're fucking out of there. Um, but anyway, yeah, she, uh, Alice sees the book and says that this is a library branch index. And the, the problem is that the phosphoromancer made it all look blank. I need you to unlock it. So 
Alice begins to do it and she's like sort of, uh, she says, if you're going to watch, I need a drink. And the librarian says, I could use one myself. And I was sort of surprised by this. And then it becomes clear that what Alice is doing is trying to like distract her because she is attempting to do some shit on her own. So we have the the scene with her manipulating the light that's coming up out of the book, which is honestly pretty cool looking. Like it seems really tedious and slow, this spell, but it turns out that it's able to, she's able to do it much faster than this. She's just sort of drawing it out in order to get herself some time. So the librarian gets up because she has to go pee. And at when she does, Alice gets up, does the whole thing on the book and manages to like clear it up really, really quickly and finds exactly the information that she needs because what she is going to do is the bad idea seance, evidently. And we see her at the end of the episode assembling all of the equipment to do so. Um, and... I have no idea what the fuck is she's trying to animate this like doll thing that she has created, but that seems like the goal and I do not care for it. I had said I'm on record as saying I don't want people trying to bring people back. We'll see how this goes. Uh, as for Katie, she's coping with the all of the hedges who got the tattoos to keep them from casting thinking that it was going to help them out, realizing that now they need to be able to cast. And, oh, right. Jesse says, Dean Fogg mentioned someone stole the school's entire supply of living clay. Living clay is such a creepy couple of fucking words put together. No, thank you. Um, but Katie, yeah, Katie and Pete, uh, are approached by a hedge whose arm got cut off because he was trying to remove the tattoo or his friend was. And she is able to reattach his arm, which, uh, damn, good job, Katie. But she is really frustrated at the fact that there are so many hedges out there going through this now. And the, apparently, like, the process for removing it is really really tricky um and i'm trying to find the spot where she and pete go to the librarian for help because they find that one dude that we did not like uh who was as he puts it in a neutral and uh he's new chaotic neutral i don't think i would put him at chaotic neutral but i guess if that's what he wants to call it um because they are trying to find out what is it at the location that he sends them to that they are even looking for. I don't even remember now. But they go to this place that he sends them and the uh, building is gone. And they wind up having to... Oh, right. Here it is. Okay. So first, she... <laughs> uh, Pete says, you got that look, boss. And she says he was so afraid of not having magic, he was willing to risk blowing his own arm off to get it back. I thought when we got magic back, things would get better. They said they would take away all the marks and they haven't. And Pete's like, dude, the library is literally disintegrating in front of our eyes. Of course, they're not following through on this thing that takes organization. There's nobody there anymore. So she says, let's figure out a way to remove them ourselves. And they go to this club where chaotic neutral librarian says that the information they want is in a particular book and it's in this like drop spot that nobody has apparently attended for a while and he can tell them where to find it um and also there will be other goodies there as well and katie's like well if there are other goodies there, why aren't you robbing it? And he's like, oh, I don't fucking know how. I would literally be decapitated. So they go over there and uh, the building appears to be gone. They quiz a dude who has worked in front of it for a minute. And she says that the wards 
are still like there's still residue. Somebody stole the building. To which Pete is like, anybody who can do that, steal a whole building and a building that is warded like that is somebody that I do not want to tangle with. <laughs> like that is that is some high level shit. So and they mind wiped everyone in the area because the guy who's working in front of this spot where the building had been is real sarcastic about, yeah, oh, sure, I've worked here eight years and there was definitely I never noticed the building vanish. But it seems that that is what's going on. Um, and she, so, yeah, she says, I think we might have some competition, which uh, is weird because like. Just let them figure it out then the way she says competition I mean, I guess she's the, – there's so many other books in the dispensary that they could be after anything because um, I'm thinking that they're after that same book. But yeah, maybe not. Um, oh, man. And I forgot. I meant to talk about Julia's encounter with this fucking pig and I'm like out of time now and I forgot about it. I just have to say I love this pig the whole way they've decided to build this guy because he's from Fillory. He's a little pig man. And he is sort of like a Dickensian era, like, you know, the way he dresses and everything. And be, like having him be a pig, he's he's literally a chauvinist pig. It's it shouldn't be as funny as it is, but it just works so well. And he is here looking for Quentin. And when she tells him Quentin is dead and offers to help herself he assures her that there is no way she could possibly be the hero we need because she's a woman. And she is so angry. The The whole interaction, he, he says that perhaps she's having hysterics and that he has heard that pelvic massage can work to help that kind of problem. It's great. Like he is really a perfect representative of, of all of the ridiculous, like, sexist pseudoscience that was believed during the era that he is representing with his, like, costume. It's really funny. So in the end, when she's talking to Penny, she basically is like, you know what? I don't need him to give me a quest. I am going to fix this. I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to do something about it. And I don't need his permission. I don't need somebody to like hand me my destiny. I have to figure out what I want and then go do it. And that's all there is to it. So that is what she resolves to do. So, yeah, I am uh, very curious what that pig will make of her if he runs into her again and finds out that she's already decided to just like embark on this quest. Um, all right. That's everything. Thank you guys so, so much for listening. Thank you, Jesse, for bearing with me, with me being off schedule. I really appreciate you all. I hope you're enjoying the coverage. I'm really excited to start this season. It, I, it seemed like it was so much time between when I looked at the calendar, the finale of last season and this episode, but the time passed super quick. Like it does not feel like it's been long at all. So that worked out quite well. Um, all right, everybody, I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. And until then... Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.